Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is Nomadic Matt, aka uh, Matthew Kepnis. Um, he runs an award-winning uh, budget travel site called Nomadic Matt. Um, after a trip to Thailand in 2005, he started. He quit his job, finished his MBA, uh, and has been traveling ever since. Uh, the trip was supposed to last a year, but over a decade and a hundred countries later, uh, he's still traveling. Uh, writing books, blogging, he's created companies, like all these things. It's um, pretty impressive. So um, he's the author of a book called How to Travel the World on $50 a Day. It's a New York Times bestseller. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, blogging, books, growing a business, kind of the intersection of all of those things. Matt, great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Chandler. So uh, take me back. Well, uh, you, obviously, you've got a successful blog, site, business, all that stuff. Why did you decide to, to, to write your first book and kind of where'd that come from? Uh, <clears throat> so that, that book, How to Travel the World on $50 a Day, started as an ebook back in 2010, 2011, um, somewhere around there. And the goal of it was <clears throat> to take what I had on my website, maybe expand it a little bit, but use it as sort of a coupon book. So you buy this ebook, it was like 20 bucks. Uh, and you get a thousand dollars in travel discounts from partners I had worked with, right? So sort of like that entertainment book. I don't know if you ever used that, but it was like forty bucks, and it was like a stack of restaurant discounts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. movie discounts, like kind of bowling discounts. Yeah, you know, you're just you're selling the discount, right? The information was sort of secondary. Um, I figured, hey, people can get info for free, but they can't get the discounts, uh, and then. A friend of mine's editor at Penguin stumbled across the book. Um, she said it was on Chris's website, my buddy Chris. And I've never found it on his website, so oh, I have no idea. Uh, but anyway, she was like, hey, uh, I want to turn this into a print book. Uh, and then after being like, mm, are you a legit person? Checking her LinkedIn and, and seeing, yes, this person is actually an editor at Penguin. Uh, I was like, sure, let's do it. So the first version came out uh, in 2013, and subsequently there's uh, a second and third edition because travel changes. Uh, the book gets thicker and thicker each edition. Uh, and I'll probably do a fourth one, you know, in like tw in 23, you know, after COVID, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's really how it came about. You know, I, you know, I turned like a 40 page ebook into a 250 page print book. Uh, mm. It was a very long process. Uh, yeah. You got to get a lot more specific, a lot more detailed, but it's pretty. I found that one to be a lot easier than writing uh, my memoir, which is, you know, you got to have conversation. Mm. There's a liter it's literature, right? You know, yeah. You got to get people entertained. A guidebook is just like, here's a bunch of bland facts. Do this. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, a, I've got an earmark to ask you about that a little bit later, kind of the difference between those two. How did you, how did you go from 40, uh, 40 page ebook to 240 page traditionally published book? Like what did that process look like? So once I outline the arc of the book, which is pretty much before you go, how to save money before you go and plan your trip, how to save money when you go. That's two halves, right? Uh, and then there was section three, which is, here is regional specific information because how you save money in Europe is going to be different than how you save money in Australia, right? So we plotted the general route around the world, which is, you know, South America, you know, Europe, uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, that kind of Central America, that kind of arc. Um, in subsequent editions, we've added China and India and a couple of more regions around the world. Um, that are sort of like common places people go to. Mm, uh, I might sense. add a U.S. section in um, the fourth edition because now I have a ton of U.S. content that I could just because mm, of COVID. Nice. You know, I I did most of my domestic travel, so yeah. I finally started writing about the U.S. <laughs> um, I mean, I had some stuff before, but like now, yeah. I mean, I've taken like six road trips around the U.S. So like, we just yeah. wrote a whole new guidebook to road trip in the US. Um, yeah. But once you plotted that out, it was just filling in sort of the information and just being really specific. You know, luckily at the time I was 
I became really close friends with the guidebook writer and he sort of mentored me through this process of being like, you have to dumb it down to like a first grade level, like do this, then do this. And like, so you had to get really specific because when you're an expert in something, your mind doesn't go A, B, C, D, it goes A to M, right? Because <clears throat> the, all the other letters sort of just become rote memory. Like you, it's just like, second nature, right? You know, like, um, so you forget a lot of the steps along the way. So I had a lot of people just sort of read it and be like, where are you confused? Yeah. Um, oh, so cool. a lot of that, and a lot of that is research um, yeah. too. Like, you know, I had to get prices for things and website names and, and just sort of drill down to a level of, you know, specifics that you don't really have to do on online. Yeah. Because nobody wants to read 15,000 words on backpacks, right? Yeah. You know, they just like, they just want to be told, buy this backpack. Okay. Yeah. You know, like, but here you sort of break down all the steps of like what to look for, you know, what are the companies, like what material, like, so. Yeah. And it needs to be a little bit more timeless because maybe the best backpack to buy will change, <laughs> um, but the fundamental principles of picking one will stay the same and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. What? So, so focus is a lot more on fundamentals. I mean, the things yeah. that we change the most from addition to addition are companies, you know, uh, prices, um, you know, that kind of things that change. So why, um, why did you decide to, you know, it's self-published, it seems like, and it was doing pretty well and just selling it on your site. Why did you decide to take the traditional publishing deal? Was there a decent advance or what was kind of the thought process there? Um, <clears throat> it was doing okay on the site. It was consistent. Uh, but, you know, you're, when you're new, having a, a vetted book, right? Having a gatekeeper say, this is a real expert you know, does um, lend a lot of credibility to who you are, right? You know, rather than just being a, a, a blogger online with an ebook that people download as a PDF, I'm now a travel writer with a guidebook that you can buy in stores, right? So there's a level of authority that comes with that. Um, you know, then there's sort of, it's a great reason to get media attention, right? You know, you send books out to, you know, media and journalists. Now they have a physical copy in their hand that they can read. And so it was just a way to legitimize my expertise, get a lot of media attention. And, you know, you end up going on a book tour and you're in all these uh, small towns and, you know, cities and you know, people who just come to book events might not have heard of you otherwise. So... Nice. That makes sense. Now what, um, you hit New York times with that, uh, New York times bestseller with list with that book. how did you do that? Was that in the first edition when you traditionally published or when was it and how'd you do it? Uh, we hit the list on the second edition, uh, because in the first edition, I made a lot of assumptions about how, you know, the publisher would take a lot of the marketing and they, they did not, um, they don't tend to, throw a lot into the marketing. So I did a lot of it and I was just very, it was sort of last minute. It was like, hey, I got a book coming out next week. Uh, so in the second one, I hired a marketing firm to sort of have more structure with it. And we did a lot more publicity. We did a lot more podcasts at the time. This is uh, the second edition came out in 2015. Um, we did, you know, I, I had more things planned and lined up. So like I started writing guest posts six months in advance, not a month in advance, right? And then I had all those guest posts and those podcasts lined up to go right away, right? Rather than be like, hey, I got a book coming out, you know, can you post about it? Be like, you have to post about it this week. And so in a lot of the book tour was that first month, right? So, you know, in the New York Times, traditional publishing, uh, traditional book sales costs are weighted a lot heavier, right? So I did a lot of independent bookstores bunched together that first like month to sort of give that more weight. Mm. So all that got me on the list. Now, I mean, you know, they don't have a travel list anymore. So I, I don't get on the list for subsequent books because. Yeah. You know. 
travel's not that big of a niche. It has to end up like, you know, wild or something like that. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. So what would you, you, you mentioned a, a few of the things that you did um, to, so I guess there's, there's stuff that you do during launch and then there's the evergreen stuff that just keeps the book um, selling long-term. I, I guess let's start with the launch. Like what were the top two or three things that moved the needle um, and, and actually sold the most books? Uh, traditional publications sell a lot of books, right? And I mean, traditional, i uh, sorry, traditional bookstores will sell a lot of books. Like if you go to an event, you know, you, you usually get like half the people there will, will buy a book, right? So that really moved a lot of copies for me. Um, I found radio moved a lot of copies. I did some NPR stuff and that moved more copies uh, and podcasts moved a lot of copies. And then when you say traditional bookstores, were you doing um, like a book tour in traditional bookstores and that, that moved copies or was it something else? Yeah, we did a book tour. So going to small independent bookstores around the country, like that moves a lot of copies, more than you'd think, you know, because um, a lot of people show up to those. Um, I found, you know, big publications, you know, you can get on Good Morning America and that's great branding, but few people buy books. Reddit is a great way to buy, sell books. You do a big AMA, it has the front page, you have your Amazon link in there, that sold a lot of books. Uh, Interesting. Influencers sell a lot of books. I mean, so like nowadays, you know, giving your book to people with blue check marks is a great way to pitch the book. And podcasts, podcasts. You know, people take a lot of action from podcasts. Yeah. And then the, the, the Reddit thing, what, how, how did you set up that, the, the AMAs and especially for people who are maybe met, less familiar with Reddit, how did that work? And why do you think that was so successful to sell books? Um, so with the Reddit AMA, you, know, you have your bio, hi, I'm nomadic man. I spent 10 years traveling the world, ask me anything. Right. Um, and then, you know, you send the proof, which is like a picture of me, uh, or like link to like my Twitter thing being like, I'm about to go live on Reddit. And then you can link to the book there. And so if you go pretty viral, we ended up on the front page of Reddit for a couple hours, um, that, you know, people come over and they see your link. You know, they see the AMA, they interact with you, and then they have a link right there to buy your book. That makes sense. And then what, um... Cause I, you know, I haven't heard of a ton of people doing radio stuff. How did the, how did the NPR, like, how did you land that? And, and, and why do you think that works so well? Um, think about like radio kind of sticks in people's brains and a lot of people listen to radio at home. So if you're at home, near a computer, right? Like good morning America, great publicity, right? Uh, but when do people watch GMA? right before they leave, while they're at the airport in a hotel. Um, I've heard from many, many authors. You know, I haven't gotten Good Morning America, but I did get some on my other local news. You know, they go on Good Morning America and they don't see a book, like a spike in book sales, but they go on, you know, Joe Rogan's podcast and boom, there's like 10,000 copies sold. Um, <laughs> So radio kind of works that way too, you know, there's, when people will take an action from it. And so that ended up, I just ended up on like uh, the local Dallas affiliate and it just got syndicated nationally. Interesting. When so, I, and, and, and I would imagine NPR radio is probably the closest thing to a radio version of a podcast because the type of people that yeah. are listening to that are the type of people who would buy books. Yeah, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of true, you know, not to stereotype, but also, you know, people who listen to NPR tend to be intellectual in some way and intellectual street books. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm curious, how'd you come up with the title for that book? It's such a clear, it's a great title. How, uh, did you have that before you went the traditional publishing route? Did you change the title when you traditionally published no, that was the original title from the ebook. So, I mean, it was basically it was for SEO, right? You know, coming out, you know, remember it started as a blog. So what do people search for? How to travel the world. 
So, you know, you, you search for that and we come up as how to travel the world on $50 a day. Um, it's sort of like, uh, it's, it's not a huge price, like a hundred dollars a day, or it's not like so cheap that, uh, people would be like, Oh, I don't want to do $10 a day. Like that probably is like roughing it to a way that I don't want to, but this is sort of like a, the Goldilocks zone. Um, but also it's sort of, you know, how much I spent roughly on, uh, my first year away. You know, I spent 20 K on that first year. Um, and so with, with knowing what I know now, you can get that cost down, but you know, the, you know, so $50 a day is an all in number too. It's, you know, your flight, your insurance, your backpack, all amortized into that cost. Mm, nice. Now, anything that you've done to get reviews, I mean, you have so many, you've got, I'm looking right now, 898 reviews on that book, 231 reviews on your memoir, anything that you, you've seen that's worked or any intentionality behind that, or has that kind of just happened? Um, I ask people, you know, you get a lot when you ask people. So obviously, you know, people leave reviews, but, uh, I will just once in a while, um, just say like, Hey, can you leave a review of my book? You know, uh, you sort of where I'll hit a milestone. So if I'm near a nice round number, let's say a thousand or something like that, you know, after 900, I'll probably just send out an email and be like, hey, you know, like, it'd be really cool to get that vanity metric of a thousand reviews. Uh, will you drop, drop a review into, into it? And most people will. You know, uh, when those come out, I always ask people to leave a, re leave a review uh, because that's a good signal to Amazon and to the public in general. Oh, this book has like 5,000 reviews. Like, people really like it. A lot of people must have bought this book. Yeah, that's good. What, what would be your advice be, or what would your advice be for other, because uh, I think you had a, a growing and successful blog and then wrote a book. Some people go kind of go book first and then grow a blog. Like any advice for other bloggers who are thinking about writing a book, kind of knowing what you know now? Um, one, it's going to take longer than you think. Um, if it's, if it's a practical book, be super detailed. Um, you want to just <clears throat> assume nothing. And I would definitely say if it's a practical book uh, about what you know, send it to people that are your friends who know nothing about your, the topic because they're going to find where you make sort of mental leaps without explaining like how you got from A to D, right? Because, you know, when things become second nature, it's sort of just automatic in your brain. You, you, you stop thinking about it. But for someone just starting out, they have to think of every step. They haven't internalized that process yet. And if it's for, you know, like a uh, memoir or some sort of nonfiction book or even a fiction book, just get very emotional. People read stories for emotion. Nobody is going to spend 10, very few people, I won't say nobody, very few people are going to spend 10 years traveling the world, right? Um, so it's the emotion of the journey that they can relate to, not the journey itself. Think mm. of any book, any book you write, it's always like what keeps you going is like you become engaged with the story and the emotions and the characters. It's true for a memoir or a fiction book. Um, so just that was the hardest part for me is just learning to like bleed onto the page. You know, and just pour those emotions out of me. It took a lot of edits and a lot of pride in because I'm tend to be a pretty private person. Um, so, um, that, um, yeah, I would say those two things. And then it's all in the marketing, right? You know, like yeah. these days, like that's those two things for the writing, but you know, when you're marketing a book, um, a lot of it's in the prep work, you know, don't do what I did and just start a couple of months before, you yeah. know, in subsequent books, we do like six, seven months, you know, in yeah. advance. And especially when it comes to things like podcasts, um, you know, people set their podcast schedules like really far in advance. And so 
uh, <clears throat> if you want to get on someone's podcast, you know, you should give them enough lead time because sometimes they'll record five, five months, you know, in advance, right? Six months in mm -hmm. advance. And so if you're like, Hey, I, I have a book coming out in two months. Like, can we do it? They can be like, sure, we can record in two months and then it will, the podcast will come out like three months later. Yeah. And since so podcasts can, yeah. tend to sell a lot of books, I definitely recommend being on as many as possible. Cool. Yeah, I agree with that. What, um, any, any other big differences between writing the, you know, kind of a more fact-based book and then, and then later on writing your memoir, any, anything else you learned from kind of the, the differences in those two genres? <clears throat> well, I mean, I, you know, facts are easy. It's just do this, then do that, <laughs> then do that. Here's for six companies, right? It's, it's a very dry style of writing, uh, yeah. but it's an easy style of writing. I, you know, you, you just gotta learn to be like super detailed, like you're writing, you know, a, a TV manual. Um, memoirs and stories, much more difficult because you have to keep um, people's attention for, you know, 250, 300 pages, right? Without being repetitious, without, uh, with, you know, with providing depth of character and, and just, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, and you have to be emotional because again, people are going to relate to the emotion of it all. Um, so even if you're, you have a philosophy book that you're writing or you just want to write, you know, a fiction story, you know, people get invested in the emotions and in the characters. And that is really important to like focus on. Mm. Yeah. that's how people connect yeah you know, and, it's why and, oh, yeah, sorry no okay. good yeah i was gonna say you know it's why we read you know travel books um that are 50 60 years old right you know or or even you know like on the road i mean you can't you can't repeat that experience because like route 66 doesn't exist the way it did back during the beat generation but that sense of adventure, that sense of wanting to leave and, you know, and, and having these, and thinking about having these great experiences, that's what keeps you turning the page. Mm. That's what makes you, you know, dream. Um, that's what connects you to the characters. Cause you're like, oh, that's how I feel too. Yeah, that's good. How, how was the marketing different? How did you market the travel <clears throat> guide differently from the memoir and vice versa? Uh, yeah gonna go back to remember those things um the the guide is sort of like if you've ever wanted to travel but didn't think you have the money here's a book that will um change your mind mm. so it's sort of like good hook what's the problem you can't afford to travel what's the solution this book yeah uh similarly in the other one it was more about you know if you've ever wondered what it was like to travel uh, and are worried that like, you're not gonna make it, here's a book that talks about the experience. You know, so it was sort of aimed at people who like to travel already because they'll buy any book on travel and people who are dreaming about travel, but unsure if they have the skills to make it. Hmm. You know, the soft skills, you know, like, ooh. You know, who wonder like, what's the experience like? You know, so it's sort of like a gateway drug book into buying the second one. Got it. The you're saying the memoir is is kind of a gateway into and buying the other one. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, if you're if you're kind of wondering what it's like to travel, you buy that book, and you're like, okay, now I'm going to travel. Now I can yeah. be like, well, here's a guidebook for you too, or vice versa. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. they they're two sides of the same coin, and uh, you know that's why I kind of wrote that second one. One mm -hmm. is about the emotional nature of travel. When is the practical nature of travel? Got it. That makes sense. Now, kind of final question or two. How, how have these books helped fuel the business growth and also like monetization on the blog? Like, what does that look like? <clears throat> I wouldn't say the books have helped monetize the blog directly. You know, there's an indirectness to it because, you know, you buy the book at a bookstore, you come join my newsletter, I'm going to monetize you that way. It's sort of 
more about brand awareness, right? Yeah, I sell books and that's great. And, uh, you know, I sell them through the website, you know, people click to Amazon. Uh, but in terms of living in the ecosystem, it's brand awareness, right? People buy from a bookstore, they Google my name, they, they see it in a hostel, they, they Google the, web, the name, right? So, you know, there's no, at least I can't trace a direct, like, because of these, these books came out, I made more money. I can tell you when the books come out, I get more traffic and more email signups, which is then how I make money. Uh, but, you know, so I view them as sort of like branding, right? You know, you go, you host an event where you go to, you know, speak at a conference, they sell your book, right? Um, you know, I, I used to speak to the New York Times travel show when they used to do it. And, you know, we'd get 50, 60 copies of my book and, you know, they, they disappear, right? To a lot of people who haven't heard me speak before. So it's yeah. like, hey, now that you just heard me speak, now go buy my book. Sort of like if you speak yeah. at a conference, right? You want yeah. your book there because that's a prime opportunity. For sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And so um, in what, like, what's the ultimate outcome? So it sounds like it's like a, it's a top of funnel, like brand builder, bringing people into the audience, all that. And sure you make some money off the books, but then you said you get on the newsletter and, and that sort of thing. So how do you monetize from there? Um, on the website, we monetize a bunch of different ways. We have ads, uh, they pay a ton of money, uh, affiliates, you know, from credit cards, travel insurance, to hotels, um, to hostel bookings, everything in between. Um, those are two, the majority of stuff. And then I have some digital guides that we sell, uh, but we also have like a membership program that mm -hmm. we started during COVID, you know, it's five, five to 20 bucks a month. And depending on what you pick. Uh, you might get a free copy of the book um, or um, free eBooks. So yeah. you sort of monetize a bunch of different ways. Got it. That but makes sense. Ad revenue and affiliates represent probably like two thirds of all my revenue. Got it. And are you doing affiliate stuff through the book? Like when you have recommendations, is that, is that kind of how you monetize on the back end of the book is people can go to a resource page and they can, those are all affiliate links and they can buy stuff recommended in the book or is that, is that totally separate? On those eBooks? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, people buy the eBooks too, they're 10 bucks, yeah. but because they're digital, we also have it where you have it in the PDF and you click a link and yes, then that makes those sense. are affiliate links too. Yeah. And then is that, it, did the publisher make you not do that for like the traditionally published books? Like you couldn't, you couldn't monetize that way? Uh, I mean, it's hard to monetize a book where um, people have to type in the sure. URL. But, but there isn't like a, a, a um, like a nomadic mat forward slash discounts or something like that, that people were going, no, were going into. No. Got it. Okay. No, it just got too, too big. And a lot of travel companies don't like discounts on like main, like public pages. Public pages they get scraped by retail me not and they end up losing a bunch of money. <laughs> happy about it. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Uh, well, Matt, this has been great, man. Um, a couple final questions. Knowing what you know now, what would your advice be uh, to the person who's thinking about writing their first book? On your first book, I definitely say do a traditional publisher because it's sort of still credible, right? I mean, even, you know, screw gatekeepers and all that stuff, right? But like, when you can just like be at a party and people are like, oh, you get a book? You're like, yeah. And you're like, who's publishing it? Myself? Oh, Penguin? Oh, that's really cool, right? Because people still know these publishing houses as like, oh, that's, you know, you're legit. Um, and it's a lot easier to get traditional media when you have that sort of backing. Uh, but subsequently, the, the ecosystem has changed so much that you, know, you can pay to get into bookstores now. There are many companies out there that you, know, you give them the manuscript, they'll, do, they'll make it like a quote unquote real book um, that you can then you know, pay to place into bookstores basically being the role of the author and publishing house at once. Um, so, you know, 
yeah, that's a that's a large upfront cost that you know, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, uh, but you get to keep one hundred percent of your your book sales, um, and by then you've already established credibility as an author, you know, as as that independent source that media will have you on. So first book, traditional. Second book, yeah, screw it. Like, my, I will probably write a book again next year. I'm, I'm not going to do traditional publishing. I'm going to just become my own publishing house. Got it. Cool. Well, Matt, where can people go to find out more about you, um, what you're up to, and, and check out all your stuff? Yeah, it can be found at nomadicmat.com uh, and at nomadicmat on every social media website. I'm very well branded. And if you just forget, you like the map that travels into Google and it'll pop up. <laughs> How about that SEO? That's awesome. Yeah. Well, hey, Matt, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. I mean, I just like quickly typed in the map that travels into Google. Uh, but there's a different travel map there. So, oh, it's Matt Bowling Wong. Oh, yeah, that's that guy. He's a <laughs> SEO. So maybe just type in like nomadic Matt. Get <laughs> nomadic Matt. Type yes, it in. Matt. Awesome. Appreciate you, bud. All right. Thanks for having me.